All righty, folks, we have the best of the best with us, Mr. Jason Pritchard. How you doing, sir? I'm doing great, Zuber. How are you? I'm doing very, very well. So uh, I know you are very uh, active on Instagram. Thank you for interacting with all the one rental at a time folks that DM you. Love to do it. Uh, I want to read you a DM I got from Gavin this morning. I'll just read the whole thing in total. And then there's really two parts of it we'll, we'll dig into. It says, this is from Gavin. I'm looking to buy my first small multifamily unit. It sounds like you're saying we should wait to buy properties. When do we know the right time to pull the trigger? Hmm. So I don't know where you want to go with this. You're the guest. Where where would you get if you got this uh, comment? Lots to unpack here. So it sounds like, Gavin, if you watch this video, um, you're kind of stuck maybe a little bit in this analysis paralysis stage, right? And I think you're maybe looking for some confirmation on when to pull the trigger and when's the right, when's like the right time to do that. I would give you this piece of advice. The last video we talked about understanding what a great deal looks like. And I think you probably need to do a little bit more work in that process and understanding your market and what a, what defines a great deal in your market. Because when you have a great deal, that's the time to buy. And having a great deal is not dictated by what the market is doing. So the market, whether it's up, down, or sideways, there's great deals to be had in any market. So I think you need to understand, like Zuber says, what your buy box is, what is a great deal inside of that buy box, right? And then once that pops up, then feel free to pull the trigger on it. So that's how that's the advice that I would give to Gavin. What do you think? So uh, here's my here's my response. After you do the work, and you learn what an average deal is, that's what I replied with. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So again, folks here might watch my daily financial news. They hear me talk about the market slowing down, inventory, all of this, eight percent mortgage rates for investors. They're like, Michael, you're telling me not to buy. No, I'm not saying yeah. don't buy. I'm saying do the work. I'm actually, you know, this is my belief. This will be the second, the next 12 months, Jason, will be the second best time ever in my career to find motivated sellers. Only 2010 being better. Who the hell is going to buy a property at 8% mortgage rate? Shoot, who the heck is going to list a property at 8% mortgage rates? Only yeah. motivated sellers. And those are the people I want to buy from. Yep, that's it. And I think we talk about it and we harp on it all the time. It's it's It seems repetitive, guys, but you have to really understand your market. You have to understand what defines a great deal. And if you can do those things, then it's just being in the market and understanding and looking at these things all the time, right? Because if you're putting yourself in the game and then you're doing the reps, I think that's the the step that a lot of people hesitate. They get to the point where in a bubble, they understand what a great deal is. They, they look at a spreadsheet and say, here is what it is. You've got to get out of that bubble, get off the sidelines, get in the games, and then just start making offers. And I get people that reach out to me all the time. And just because you make an offer on something doesn't mean you're obligated to do anything. You know, that's just another step in the process. I think a lot yeah. of times people get that part misconstrued too. And it's like, you want them to say yes to your offer when you send it out. If you if you wrote the off if you wrote the offer up the right way, right? So yeah. you know, then you get in there, then you do your due diligence, and then figure out how you perform after that. So yeah, you just uh, you have to get off the sideline and get in the games. Here's a good question I've never asked you before, uh, and you'll probably just have to take a swag, which is entirely okay. How many times has and this is you, Jason, the buyer, not Jason, the seller. Maybe okay. we'll ask the seller, but the buyer first. You get into contract at X price. Mm -hmm. What percentage of those deals that close, so you don't get out of it, but you close, are at X price or something less than X? Like you got a credit or something during due diligence caused you to get a, you know, a lower number. What what percent? I would, would say probably I, if I had to guess around 15 percent. So my yeah. business model, because we're doing all, almost all direct to seller, right? We're. I like to pride myself when we go in contract with the seller, a lot of times, you know, there's some type of life event or circumstance yeah. that's causing them to sell. So there's a lot riding on the sale of this property, right? Mm -hmm. And we don't want to, this is a tactic that we see a lot of times when people will lock up a, a contract at a higher price and then intentionally try to reduce. And we end up working with a lot of sellers that have their deals fall out of contract with other investors. So I pride myself on, making sure that the number that we hit, we're going to be able to perform at if we come to an agreement on a seller. But sometimes you get in there and you do your due diligence and it just doesn't make sense. And 
that's part of this business too, guys. I mean, anybody that tells you yeah. they've made an offer and they've always performed to that offer, they haven't made that many offers, guys. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's just part of the that's part of the deal that you're going to end up having reductions or when you do your inspection, yeah. something crazy pops up. So that, I'd say about fifteen yeah, percent. Yeah, I would guess mine's right around ten or fifteen percent. Again, remember most of my purchases, unlike Jason, are out of the MLS. Lots more disclosures, lots more exactly. data there. Yeah, for me, and that's the difference. Through. And that's a big thing when you're going off market versus something that's listed. It's a it's a little bit of a riskier game when it comes to due diligence when you're buying direct to seller because the value proposition that you have, guys, is that we're not going to drag you through all these inspections. We're not going to make you. It's as is sale, no repairs, no you know, and that's why we you know, we buy at 30, 40, 50 cents on the dollar to offset some of those surprises. When you're buying on market, a better question to ask is when you're buying and tying things up off market, I bet you my percentage a lot of times is higher because it's just more, nor it's just kind of a normal thing, I think, in that situation, right. especially for me as a seller, I'm always getting hit for reductions. I mean, 100% <laughs> of the time on the stuff that we sell, we're always yeah. getting asked for reductions or credits or repairs. So yeah, it's a different, a different ballgame. Yeah, I, I would totally agree with that. When I'm the net seller of something, the the credits are certainly over 50% sure. as a seller. They're asking for something. Uh, I wanted to bring this up because, again, you're in the private Facebook group for one rental at a time, and I tagged mm -hmm. you on a post the other day. Yeah. I just want to kind of replay it here and um, kind of operate how you and I would do. And this is for a buy and hold rental, right? So you get into contract. You agree on a price. You are told a, a certain rent number. Let's say it's two, 200 grand and rents 200 bucks. You get in a contract. Then you find out that the $2,000 rent is not rent. It's rent plus water plus garbage plus this, that, the other. So the actual rent element is probably $1,700. Yep. In that case, would you, Jason Pritchard, go back to the seller and say, hey, this is not what we agreed to. We need to uh, either cancel or renegotiate because I calculated this based on 2000 rent and this is not 2000 rent. Would you renegotiate? Um, I, I think that if I was already kind of at my red line for what that offer would be a hundred percent, I would go back and ask for a reduction. Oh. If there were yeah. other things about the deal that I really liked and that, you know, I felt like it was a deal breaker, then maybe not. I wouldn't have any problem asking though. So let's, let's put that as the caveat, right? So I would have no problem asking oh. and throwing it out there. I would ask then, for sure. Yeah. So then you know, all they're going to do is say yes or no. If it's no, and it's not a complete deal killer, then we move forward. But if it, if that spread and that variance and the maintenance and stuff that's adding up there, I would, I would, uh, I'd walk away from the deal if the numbers didn't make sense. You guys have to not get personally attached to these things, right? I think yeah, a lot again, of times, especially at the beginning, you fall in love with deals and yeah. you can't be emotionally attached. Yeah. So again, you write up the offer, you celebrate, you get your first yes, you open escrow. And then during the due diligence, you find out that it's 1700 rent plus expenses, not 2000. 100% I'm going back to the seller and the seller's agent saying this was a misrepresentation. Not okay. Yep. Uh, work and, and believe me, in my model, I'd be asking for a lower price because again, I base it off rent, not this bigger number. Mm -hmm. um, but you're right. If for some reason there was other meat on the bone that maybe it was value add that the seller wasn't appreciating and I could yes. get around it. That's yeah. sure. Yep. But most people buy and hold, it's not going to cash flow, right? You just lost 300 bucks, which was probably your spread for cash flow. So uh, I would have no problem going back and saying, ah, I'm out. You know, instead of 200, we need to do 175 or something like that. I don't know. Yeah. Don't be afraid to ask, guys. Yeah. That's a, a good rule of thumb in this business. If you, it, it, worst case scenario, you're going to be in the same exact spot that you're in now. And then you can make your decision from that point. Jason, you do a lot of great stuff, uh, both on Instagram. And uh, you have a website with a wealth, a treasure trove of information. Where can people find you and find it? Yeah, jasonpritchard.com. We've got tons of documents and resources that my team use in our business uh, every single day available for free. And then if you just want to follow along on our journey, I share a lot of stuff on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, my handles on both are just Jason Pritchard. And uh, feel free to message me. I get tons of feedback and engagement from the One Rental at a Time community. I love helping you guys. Um, and so, yeah, happy to be a resource if I can be. Thank you, buddy.